Hey everybody, Kenneth Arthur here from Field Goals, back again to talk about the Seattle Seahawks. And this week it's the divisional round matchup against the Atlanta Falcons, a huge game for both teams. Both teams have monkeys on their backs. For the Falcons, they're trying to prove that they can win in the playoffs 0-3 in their last three playoff games under Mike Smith and Matt Ryan. Still trying to get that one win after that really... Not cool block box score last year, 24 to 2. Nobody wants to see that. You'd also rather get shut out than know that the only thing you could do was score that two point safety on defense, personally. But for the Seahawks, it's not necessarily that the team has a short, uh, monkey on their back, except for, you know, no championships ever, ever, ever for anybody in Seattle. Even the one that did win a championship left. Maybe we'll get one back. But really a team of players with monkeys on their back. A lot of guys that were told that they couldn't that they can't. Russell Wilson, you can't. Richard Sherman, you can't. Brandon Browner, you can't. Marshawn Lynch, you can't here in Buffalo. And now this year they're coming out, they're saying, yes, we can. It's the 2012-2013 Seattle Seahawks Super Bowl campaign. And they're saying, yes, we can. And that starts again this weekend after beating the Redskins last weekend. This weekend on Sunday against the Atlanta Falcons for the right to go to the NFC Championship game. Can they do it? Because it's not about being hungry. Whoever tells you that the team that wants it more wins, well, I just want to know which NFL players are out there saying, I don't, I mean, whatever, I guess. Championships are cool. No, everybody wants to win. Everybody, all the time, very much so. So that's not what it's going to come down to. It's going to come down to talent. So for that reason, today on the YouTube channel, we're going to be breaking down six keys phases of the game and giving the edge to which team has the edge in that phase and going back and then finally deciding who's got the edge in the entire game, who's going to win the game. We are, we are a Seahawks channel, but we're going to be completely unbiased. We're not picking all Seahawks here. we got to give it up to whichever unit deserves it the most. Okay, so let's go step by step. Phase one, the passing offense. For the Seahawks, they've come a long way during the season. They adapted during the season, and then all of a sudden, a team that couldn't get even over the 200-yard mark in the first quarter of the season, the first four games, they were hovering around 150 yards, not doing a lot. Five touchdowns, six interceptions for Russell Wilson after uh, about five games. But since then, the passing game has really taken off when the, when the offense started to mold around Wilson when he came into his own, when they let him out of the cage against the New England Patriots. 3,118 yards for Wilson passing, 26 touchdowns, 10 interceptions. You also got Golden Tate, Sidney Rice, Zach Miller. They don't put up huge fantasy numbers, but they do to get the job done. On the other side of the ball, you got the Atlanta Falcons. Now, they got a really talented veteran unit. Matt Ryan at quarterback, over 4,700 yards, 32 touchdowns, 14 interceptions. Uh, you got Tony Gonzalez, 93 catches for 930 yards. Every single catch was exactly 10 yards, I swear. Roddy White had another huge season, just keeps on doing it every year, and finally the exciting Julio Jones. This is a unit that can be, at least in the, out the, on the outside, you can't say that anybody else has a better one-two, I don't think. That's about as good as it's ever going to get. And then in the middle with Tony Gonzalez, a really tough, big passing game. You got uh, Harry Douglas also contributing sometimes, the most white guy detective name in the NFL, even though that's not what he is, Harry Douglas, Detective Harry Douglas. So which game gets the edge? It's going to be the Atlanta Falcons, definitely uh, the edge in the passing offense. However, to be successful in passing offense, you're going to have to beat the passing defense. Phase two, passing defense. For the Atlanta Falcons, surprisingly, kind of a good passing defense. They are not that great. I think they're about 24th in total passing defense, 22nd in net yards allowed per attempt uh, in passing defense. So they give up a lot of yards. However, what's important is touchdowns. Only 14 touchdowns allowed for the Atlanta Falcons compared to 20 interceptions. You're going to take that every single year. If you can get, if you're giving up those yards, but you're getting 20 interceptions and only allowing 14 touchdown passes, you're going to take that. They got really run underrated safeties, uh, and not doing bad on the corners either. You know, giving up those plays but not breaking. It's not something unsimilar to what we see with like the 2009 Saints. You know, they, they didn't look good on defense, but they also just got a lot of picks. They turned those turnovers into scores, and that's something the Atlanta Falcons are doing. So they're pretty good there. However, nobody in the NFL can match what the Seattle Seahawks have in their secondary. Guaranteed, best secondary in the NFL. This is the best. I don't know. You know, you get, there's a lot that goes into pass defense. You know, the linebackers, how you're defending the middle. But you got two All-Pro players in Earl Thomas and Richard Sherman, 
and the other two guys, Brandon Browner and Cam Chancellor, went to the Pro Bowl last year. This is the best secondary in the NFL. I'll stand by that. Uh, so in this respect, they got, they're going to be up to the challenge, are they? We'll see. Uh, I got to go with Seattle gets the edge in passing defense. Let's move it along. I'll try to go quicker. Rushing offense. Now this is going to be pretty easy to do. The Atlanta Falcons with Michael Turner in the beginning, we're getting a lot of production there. Then Turner stopped burnering, and they don't use him as much. Just 800 yards. Uh, and Jacquez Rogers, more of a passer, pass catcher than he is a runner. And for the Seattle Seahawks, Marshawn Lynch, 1,591 yards, 11 touchdowns, five yards per carry. Russell Wilson, almost 500 yards rushing, 5.1 yards per carry. This goes to Seattle in their zone blocking scheme and their run read option, uh, read zone option, pistol, whatever you want to call it. Doesn't matter. Seahawks edge. So let's move on now. Rush defense. Here's another thing that neither one of these teams were really that spectacular during the regular season in rush defense. Uh, so it's not going to be necessarily a strength uh, for anyone, especially considering that Chris Clemens is now out of this game. He was in there for most of the defensive snaps on running downs, and he's going to be out for the rest of the postseason. I don't know if Bruce McGriven is going to be able to handle that as well as Chris Clemens did. Uh, so that's going to be a question mark for Seattle. They were 26th, I believe, in the NFL in yards per carry allowed. So it was kind of a defensive clap. Even though they were 10th in total run defense, they weren't run on very much, uh, so don't necessarily think that they are a great unit in the run defense right now. However, Atlanta, not that great either. About the same, and I'm going to have to go with the Seattle Seahawks in this respect, in this edge, just based on the fact that they don't have, they have to deal with Michael Turner and the Atlanta Falcons have to deal with Marshawn Lynch. Seattle has the edge in run defense. Another hidden gem here. This is the hidden uh, edge of the game factor. Uh, special teams, as always. It's going to be play an important role when you got two teams that could be close. Who's going to get the edge on special teams? Another question mark for the Seattle Seahawks. No more Steven Hauschka this year. We're going to go to Ryan Longwell. Is he going to be able to get it done if they ask him to? You know what? I like Steven Hauschka. He was perfect inside of 50. But I just don't see it being that big of a factor, Ryan Longwell. I hope you know that he can hit any field goal within 40 yards that he's asked to hit. I don't know about outside that, but he didn't kick last year, so who knows. Uh, but he's got a lot of experience, had a lot of great years. That's why he was in the NFL for so long. Getting it done even back in Lambeau, uh, and a lot of experience kicking a dome in for the Vikings. So I'm not completely worried there. Uh, also, John Ryan, it's just a a baller. He goes beast mode on punting. Nobody can do it like John Ryan, so I'm happy there. Leon Washington, one of the best kick returners in the NFL. Uh, not so hot in the punt return this year, but finding the kick return. For the Atlanta Falcons, uh, Matt Bryant is a very good kicker. Uh, I believe Matt Bosher is their punter. You know, he's doing fine, I'm sure. You know, he's not, he hasn't got the beautiful red hair of John Ryan. Beautiful. So, uh, in that respect, it's whatever, probably even. Uh, maybe they, they got the, the edge there with Matt Bryant. However, the major difference is, I believe, Seattle's kick coverage versus Atlanta's kick returning. Uh, Seattle gets a big edge there. Seattle in Football Outsiders DVOA was third, I believe, in special teams. The Falcons are something like 19th in weighted DVOA in special teams. So there we go. I've given the last few to Seattle, so to keep it fair, we're going to let this one go to the Seahawks, because, yeah, come on, it's not about what you did before, I'm still going to go one by one. That one goes to the Seahawks, but finally, we're going to do coaching, the coaching aspect of the game, huge, really hard to judge, but we're going to try. Pete Carroll comes in, 2010, the cupboard is bare, and he stocks it up uh, with a lot of amazing talent, him and John Schneider. Daryl Bevel and Gus Bradley as the offensive and defensive coordinator really came together during the season. They were willing to adapt to Russell Wilson and change the offense. They weren't going to stick to their guns. They were going to do what worked. They were really adaptable to this team as it changed. And they found some great players. Pete Carroll, 2-1 in the postseason. I mean, this is for Seattle. This is a guy that, you know, had no success in the NFL before. Came in to USC, dominated one of their best coaches in their history, and then comes to Seattle, not a lot of question marks, and has really turned it around in three years from a time when Seattle was terrible when he got here under the coach that shall not be named to now being, I believe, the best team in the NFL today. However, Mike Smith has done a great job in his, I believe, five years in the Atlanta Falcons going to the playoffs for the fourth time 
He hasn't won a playoff game, but I don't think that you can quickly just sit here and say that he's a bad coach uh, in any respect just because he's gone 0-3 in the playoffs. Even if he loses this game, it's not going to make him a bad coach uh, just because he goes 0-4 in the playoffs. Obviously, they're going to have, they did some soul searching after last season, after that 24-2 loss. They got Dirk Cutter in as the offense coordinator. They brought in a new defensive coordinator, and they were able to adapt to what they had. They also adapted. They said Michael Turner is old. He's about to uh, send out to pasture, so we got to be able to get in some other formations. That's what uh, Cutter was able to do, and they adapted and had their best season. You can't deny 13-3. and three. You know, they got it done. I think that the Falcons are uh, maybe a little, I'm starting, you know, a little criminally underrated, but that's what we have. Uh, so we gave a bunch of those categories to the Seahawks. We're going into coaches now. Pete Carroll, Mike Smith. Uh, so in this one, I'm going to go ahead and give it to uh, Pete Carroll and Seahawks. So, who do I want to give the edge to in the overall game? Well, I mean, it's hard. You know, some of those went to Atlanta. I think one of them did. And five of them went to the Seahawks. Uh, so I think I got to go with the Seattle Seahawks. You know, I know I'm not being very nice to Atlanta right now. At least it doesn't sound like that, but I think that this, the, the Falcons might be, like I said, criminally underrated right now. If they beat the Seahawks, I think they have a good shot to go all the way. They have gotten it done all year when asked to. You know, 13-2 and going into that last game that they didn't really put a lot of effort into against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And finally, you know, getting to this point where they have the number one seed in the NFC. They're going to have home field throughout until they get to the Super Bowl, and then they're going to play a team in the NFC that I think is going to be, you know, I think the team in the NFC is going to have an advantage over whoever's in the AFC. However, I don't think they're going to get it by the Seahawks. That's my opinion. I think Seattle is a better overall team. I don't think that they're worried if there's a great, I mean, it's sure that they, you know, I'm worried. I'm scared as hell. I'm not going to deny that, but I think they're going to win this game, uh, 20, I had a number in mind, 27 to 23, Seattle. It's going to be close. Uh, I predicted a, a much bigger victory over the Redskins, and I'm not thinking that's just going to be the case this time. 10 a.m. in the Georgia Dome. It's going to be a lot tougher, especially against that passing offense. So that's it. Oh, that's all. That's all it is. Only, you know, 12 minutes of you sitting here uh, just watching the breakdown. But uh, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can follow along all the Seahawks stuff going on throughout the playoffs. And hopefully they can continue for a few more weeks. Uh, also follow on Twitter at KennethArthurS. Go to Field Goals. Follow at Field Goals and all that other nonsense. Thanks very much. Go Hawks.